وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد رسولنا النبي الامي المبعوث رحمة للعالمين. But let's now focus on this black box, so to speak, in the middle, this abstraction. So, abstraction is technically a term that you'll see all over the place in computer science and really problem solving that just refers to the simplification. Of something so that you don't focus on the lower level implementation details. You really just focus on the high level goals or the process itself.、Uh, therefore, your car, if,、uh, if you have a license and have driven or have been in a car, a car, so far as you're concerned, is probably an abstraction. Most of us, if you're like me, probably don't really know or care how the engine works and all the parts that are moving. To you, it's just a way of getting from point A to point B. It's an abstraction. But someone, hopefully, the mechanic, does know those lower level implementation details. If you You had to understand how a car works every time you want to go to school or to the store, it's probably going to be a pretty slow process. You just want to think and operate at this higher level of abstraction. And we're going to do this all the time when writing code and solving problems. So, what then is in this black box, this abstraction at the moment? Well, generally, it's what a computer scientist would call an algorithm step by step instructions for solving some problem. Now, let's consider the implementation details. That is to say, how you might solve certain problems. And let's take a, a sort of old school example, but in modern form. This icon, if you have an iPhone, is of course for your contacts application. And if you've got a whole bunch of family members or friends or colleagues in your phone book, you have some kind of contacts pictured here. And it's alphabetized typically by first name and last name. And odds are you and I are in the habit, if they're not already a favorite, of like clicking on search and then using autocomplete. And what happens when you start typing autocomplete? Well, if you type in the letter H, you'll see only presumably Hagrid, Harry, Hermione, and so forth. If you type in HA, that shows you only Hagrid and Harry. And it all happens super fast. So, how is that happening? Well, typically, you could just start at the top and look to the bottom, searching for all of the H's or all of the HA's. But for larger data sets, that's going to get slow. For the Googles of the world, that's going to get really slow. And even on our phones, when you have hundreds, thousands of contacts eventually, even that kind of approach, that algorithm step by step by, might be slow. So, how might we go about searching for someone in a phone book like this? Uh, like, say,、uh, John Harvard. Well, here's an old school incarnation of this. And、uh, odds are you might not have had occasion to even physically use this thing nowadays. And in fact, this is a bit of a white lie because this is the yellow pages, which means this is a book of companies, not people.、Uh, but for, this is all you can find. And at that, it's even hard to find this. But this is the same thing in analog form, physical form. So if I wanted to search for someone like John Harvard, how could I do that? Well, I could start on page one and I could start searching for page two. Page three, page four, page five. A little hard to do physically, especially since no one's used this phone book in a lot of years. But、uh, is this algorithm correct? Turning page by page <laughs> very inelegantly. Is this correct? Will I find John Harvard if, if he's in here? All right, so yes. I mean, this is a little stupidly tedious because if there's like a thousand pages, he might be a few hundred pages into this, but it's correct. At some point, I will find him, and if he's on the page, I'll be able to call. Why? Because presumably the names are alphabetized in here, and there's no like cheat sheet on the edge. So I have to search for John Harvard from left to right, searching for H if it's alphabetized by last name. Well, what would be marginally better? Well, how about two pages at a time? It's hard to do with a 20 year old phone book where the pages are kind of、uh, grown together, but two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. This algorithm, is this correct? All right, so no, why? Yeah, so I'm skipping every other page. So if I don't consider that and I find myself in like the I section or the J section, well, I might accidentally conclude, nope, I haven't found John Harvard yet, just because I skipped him because he was sandwiched between two pages. Now, I can fix this, I think. If I do hit the I section, well, let me just double back one page, just in case he was in that last page. So it's recoverable, but it's almost twice as fast, minus that, that hiccup there. But what most of us would do, and what your phones are doing, albeit digitally, is they open up. Roughly to the middle of the phone book. And they look down and they say, oh, I'm in roughly the M section. So I'm roughly halfway through this thousand page phone book. But what do I now know about John Harvard? Where is he? To my left or to my right? All right, so alphabetically, he's presumably to my left. And so here I can both uh, meta uh, 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 metaphorically and physically tear the problem in half. You don't need to be impressed. It's really easy down the, the spine that way. But,、uh, I know that John Harvard is to the left here, but now I can throw unnecessarily dramatically half and page one out of the way. 
And what do I now know? I've gone from 1,000 pages to like 500. I can kind of repeat roughly the same algorithm, go to the half of this. And so this time I went back a little too far. I'm in now the、um, E section. So what do I know? Is John Harvard to my left or to my right? Or to my right. So I can again tear the problem in half, throw this half away, and now I'm really flying. I'm doing it verbally slowly, but that went from 1,000 pages to 500 to now 250. And now I can do it again, 125. I do it again, roughly like 67, and keep doing it again and again and again until I get left with, hopefully, just one single page, or in this case, an ad for, ironically, a mechanic. OK, so. What is the implication for our performance? Well, let's just do this, sort of in the abstract, if you will. If that first algorithm were to be plotted just quickly on a chart without even numbers, here's my x axis, size of problem on the x axis. So the bigger the problem, the farther out that way. Time to solve the problem, the higher you go up on the y axis, the、uh, more time you're taking to solve it. How would we draw the running time, the amount of time taken to run that first algorithm? Well, it's going to be a straight line. Why? Because if you add one more page next year, because more people move to Cambridge, Cambridge, you're going to add one more page turn potentially. So, one more second, one more unit of time. So, it's a straight line, and we'll abstract it away as n. If there's n pages in the phone book, the slope of this line is essentially n. The second algorithm, wherein I was doing two pages at a time, was twice as fast, but it's still a straight line. And in fact, let me just draw some dotted lines here. If the phone book is this big, well, with my first algorithm, it might take Uh, sorry, with my first algorithm, it might take this many, this many units of time, this many steps, this many page turns. But with that second algorithm, notice that the intersection is with much lower on the yellow line than on the red. So n over 2 means there's half as many pages here if n is the number of pages. So indeed, that algorithm, the second one, is twice as fast, minus the little hiccup that I have to double back one page. But that's not a big deal if I'm still doing t- things twice as fast. But the third algorithm looks fundamentally different. It looks like this. Logarithms, if you recall from high school or prior. If you don't, that's fine too. It's just a fundamentally different function, a different shape. And notice that the green line is going up and up and up, but a much slower rate of increase, which means crazy things are possible. If two towns in Massachusetts, like Cambridge and Alston across the river, merge next year, for instance, in terms of their phone book, their phone book just got twice as big. For the first algorithm, that's going to take me twice as many steps to go through. The second algorithm, almost twi- it's going to take me 50% more steps to go through, two at a time. But the third algorithm that I ended with, tearing things again and again, dividing and conquering, if you will, in half and in half and in half, how many more steps will my third algorithm take if Cambridge and Alston merge into a phone book that's twice as big? Just one more step, right? No big deal. You just take a really big bite out of the problem once you decide if John Harvard is to the left or to the right. And so you've made much faster progress. And so this, in essence, is what your computer, your phone, is probably doing underneath the hood when searching for Harry or Hermione or Hagrid or anyone else because it's that much faster, especially when you have large data. If you don't have that many contacts, it probably doesn't matter if you search from top to bottom or more,、uh, in, more in the form of this divide and conquer algorithm. But if you're The Googles of the world, or you're analyzing large data sets, indeed, this is going to add up quite quickly. So, where do we go with this? Well, we're going to introduce next something called pseudocode. How can I translate what I did verbally there? Sort of intuitively to actual code. Well, this won't be Scratch, this won't be C or Python just yet. It's just going to be in English like syntax. And this is how many programmers would start solving a problem. They don't start typing out code in C or Python or the like. They use English or whatever their human language is to jot down an outline for their ideas. My first step really was picking up the phone book. My second step was opening to the middle of the phone book. My third step was somewhat different. Look at the page because why? My fourth step was if person I'm looking for is on the page, Page, I then do what? Never happened in my example, but I call the person, so I'm done. Else, if the person is earlier in the book alphabetically, as John Harvard was in the case of my H, then I should search to the middle of the left of the phone book. Then, otherwise, if the, and then I should go back to step three. Step three is look at the page, thereby repeating the same process again and again. Step nine, though, might be else if the person is later in the book, then let's go ahead and open to the middle of the right half of the book and then go back to line three. Else, there's a fourth scenario we should probably consider, lest my search process freeze or crash or give me one of those spinning beach balls with a bug. Yeah. 
Yeah, what if John Harvard isn't in the phone book? I'd prefer that my algorithm, my phone, not just reboot or freeze. I should handle that with some kind of catch all, else, so to speak, let's just quit the program. So there's well defined behavior for every possible scenario of the four. Now let's call out a few of these salient terms. It turns out if I highlight in yellow here, there's a pattern to what I've been doing here. These are all of my English verbs. And we're in a moment, we're going to start calling those verbs functions. When you program or write code and you want the program or the computer to do something for you, some action or verb, we're going to refer to those actions or verbs as these things called functions, like those here. By contrast, I've just highlighted instead my if, my else if, my else if, and else. This is going to represent what we're going to start calling a conditional, a proverbial fork in the road, where you can either go this way or that way, do this thing or this other thing. And you're going to decide which of those things to do. Based on what I've now highlighted here, which are going to be called Boolean expressions. Bool referring to a mathematician last name Bool. A Boolean expression is just a question with a yes, no, a true, false, a one or a zero answer, if you will. And it governs whether you do this thing or this thing or this thing or that. The indentation in this case is important. The fact that I've indented line five implies by convention in programming that I should only do line five if the answer to line four is a yes or a true. And same for these other indented lines as well. And the last characteristic here is this here.、Uh, someone called this out earlier, in fact. These lines 8 and 11 are now highlighted and represent what? What might we call these in code if you've done that? Yeah, so these are loops, some kind of cycles that result in my doing the same thing again and again. But there's a key detail with this algorithm in pseudocode. Even though it's telling me to go back to line three, why is this algorithm eventually going to stop? Why do I not constantly keep looking for John Harvard forever by nature of these loops telling me to keep going back to line three?、Uh, yeah. Good. Eventually he'll be on the page, or, or to your point earlier, he won't be at all, and we're out of pages. And so we just quit. And that's the key about going to the left half or the right half. It doesn't matter if you do the same thing again and again. You're not going to get stuck in a so called infinite loop so long as you keep dividing the problem and shrinking it into something smaller, smaller, smaller. Eventually, there's going to be no problem left to solve. So even if you don't think of yourself as a computer person, even if you've never written code, what you'll find in the coming days is that these ideas that we've just kind of harnessed from real life are at your fingertips already. And a lot of the process of learning to code. It's just going to be a bumpy、uh, some bumps in the road because you can't quite see the new syntax in a familiar way. But you'll find that the ideas, in fact, are going to be more familiar than you might otherwise think. And so we'll see in a bit, and we'll take a break in a moment、uh, to take a breather, that you will see these same ideas in a moment in the context of Scratch, an actual programming language via which we'll drag and drop puzzle pieces to make actual code work. We'll see some variants of these ideas, things called arguments and return values and variables. But we'll ultimately convert it into this somehow. Anyone want to wager what this program will do if fed to your Mac or PC or phone? Here's just a massive pattern of zeros and ones. It will indeed say, rather disappointingly apparently, just hello world. And indeed, baked into all of these zeros and ones are not just the H E L L O, but also the verbs, the action of printing something to the screen. And there's other stuff too, so that the program knows how to start and how to stop. A lot of stuff that we won't have to worry about that whoever designed the computer or the language did. But at the end of the day, you're never going to be writing these zeros and ones yourselves, though our ancestors once upon a time did in some form. We'll be using a much higher level language like this in C, or better yet, in just a moment, like in Scratch, like this. And indeed, this is why today we focus, with, focus on and begin with Scratch, this graphical programming language, so we have in a way of expressing ourselves with functions, conditionals, loops. And more, but in a way that doesn't have stupid parentheses and curly braces and all of these visual distractions in the way. And we'll translate that thereafter to this lower level language. But for now, that was a lot. That was definitely a fire hose. Let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break. Feel free to get up or stay here, and we'll resume in a bit with some actual code. <laughs>